Hello and welcome to the Women of Influence Series 2021. My name is Dina Scali and I'm joined here by my peer Mackay. Um, we today have the pleasure of interviewing the lovely Miss Liz Savile Roberts, who is um, currently serving as the group leader of the Welsh party Plaid Cymru um, in the House of Commons. So Mackay and, her, Mackay and I have some questions to ask, but before we get started, I'm just going to hand over to Liz to tell you a little more about herself and her career. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dina. Good to see both you and Mackay today. I mean, just to say, actually, what interested me about the, the invitation from your head teacher to come to speak to you is that you're attending a school quite similar to the one that I attended. I'm from South East London originally, and I went to Blackheath High School um, between the ages of 11 and 16. So seeing and learning about your experiences now and also hearing your aspirations, the fact that you have this series of interviews with, with women who are involved with politics, and I imagine women who are involved with business as well, I, I'm really glad that you're doing that. And um, just the opportunity to say a little bit about my party. And also, of course, because I am from London, um, perhaps in some ways that confounds expectations. Many people will expect somebody involved with Clyde Cymru would be born and bred from, from, from Wales. Um, but my background actually was that, as I said, I was raised in, in Eltham in South East London. I attended Blackheath High School until the age of 16. Then I went to Avery Hill, which used to be a teacher training college, but it also at the time did the International Baccalaureate, which you know, a, number of, I mean, a number of young people still follow. And as part of that, I had to do an extended essay. And I ended up doing that on early Welsh stories called the Mabinogi, which absolutely delighted me, absolutely fascinated me. And to cut a very long story short, I went to Aberystwyth to study Welsh and Irish. And except for a couple of years where I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to be doing with myself, that was really, for me, then on in, was uh, to be in Wales. And the, the one thing that I have really gained from that, um, from the experience of coming from a suburb in London, where you have all the opportunities on a plate, but the sense of being part of a wider community locally and geographically is not the same as what I have been able to well benefit from in Wales. And the one thing that, that, has, that has driven me in my politics is in this immense, immense, immensely rewarding sense of belonging. And that's partly to do with having learnt Welsh. When I learned, started learning Welsh when I was 18, um, my family are bilingual. I've got uh, grown up twin daughters. My husband is from this area around here. And it really interests me, having gone from being a English, a monolingual English speaker to becoming bilingual. Somebody will probably tell me my Welsh is dreadful at times, but it's more or less I can, I can write and I can speak. And the way that that opened up my world and you know, the way that having more than one language makes you see the world in a different way, makes you interpret the world in a different way. And again, this sense of belonging to the Welsh speaking community and the English speaking community and how that, as I said, it just opened up horizons for me. It's enriched my life so much. And that then, in, yeah, we'll talk about the politics in a moment, but that's the, at the root of my politics is that sense of, of, of belonging and how we, in all the different communities that we interact between, how that enriches our lives and our role with those communities. That was lovely and I think I've really enjoyed um, the fact that you talked about belonging. I think it's a concept we overlook and actually just continuing on that, um, it's almost like a personal, from a personal perspective, but me and Mackay ourselves are politics students in year 12 and we were just curious, um, what made you choose politics as a career? Was, was it always something you had in mind or was there a moment of realisation? Okay. Actually, this is really interesting because in preparation for this, I listened to Ruth Davidson um, I listened to her last night. And, and I, I, I know about Ruth, but I don't know her background. And in some ways, our backgrounds are quite similar because um, she was also a local newspaper journalist. And I started off, I started off as a university student. I did, the, did languages. I did a few jobs here and there to begin with. And I got into local newspaper journalism, which does give you, of course, a real interest in the things that matter to people locally, the things that they actually come to complain to you about. And that sense also of, it's really interesting describing all this work, but actually when you're a local newspaper journalist, probably a little bit different with the BBC, but there's a fundamentally same thing. What you're actually trying to do is 
the local newspapers, is sell newspapers. So you'll be looking for the stories that sell newspapers. And actually, as newspapers find it harder and harder and harder to sell, um, the stories that they want are the ones that are more sensationalist, um, quite often quite negative stories, actually, as well. You, you don't go and see the family who have lost a daughter in a horrific accident just because you want to sympathise them with them. The editor knows that, that will make a good front page story. And that's in the back of your mind all the time. And I think, I mean, Ruth talked about this as well. And I, I very much had the sense I, I was able, it was convenient because my daughters were really, my twin daughters were really little at the time, but a, a sixth form college opened up locally to where I live here. And I went to work for them. And it was that sense of going, although journalism was really, really interesting. And it gives you a sort of set of mind about how to, to talk to people and how to think things through. To go into education then, actually, I felt that I was doing something, that I was giving something back in a way that journalism, you know, local newspaper journalism wasn't quite the same. And I was with that for really um, nigh on 20 years in with education. But gradually within that too, I, I followed what is the sort of classic um, old fashioned route into politics. Uh, first of all, I got very involved with my daughter's school and trying to change things, working with the governors there. Then somebody said to me, and this is a, this is a pattern in my life, and it may be just one of these things for people to think about, particularly you know, women going into politics, the things that sort of that help us on the way. Um, someone said to me, why don't you go for the county council? And I said, oh, God, I couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't possibly, possibly do that. And, and really, really shy of it. And then they came back again and I did stand and I, I became a county councillor. And we have a slightly different arrangement here in Wales. We only have the really little councils, like the what we call community councils, but they're the smallest ones, like the parish councils. Then what in England, you have borough and district. We don't have those anymore. Uh, so we only have county council. Again, actually, it's a bit more similar to London in some ways. Um, I became a county councillor. I had responsibilities for the portfolio of education. That was quite challenging. In many ways, that was one of the experiences where you're not just being a politician saying clever things and looking, well, not glamorous, but you know, drawing attention to yourself, where you actually have to make the proper decisions. That's a really useful education for politicians. It's great being in opposition because you're never wrong. Yeah, but one of the things you do have to learn, actually, the real point of pol politics is to make people's lives better. So you have to be in a position to do that. And if you're constantly in opposition, it may give you a nice career, but you're not making that difference. And again, actually, it was one of my fellow councillors uh, who asked me uh, when the Member of Parliament for this area announced that he was going to stand down. He asked, th this councillor asked me, oh, let's go on, have a go at this. And I, I was absolutely terrified of the prospect because A, I'm a woman and this is a rural, traditional, conservative, small C area, and B, that I wasn't from a traditional well-speaking background. And this is this is the most Welsh-speaking county in the world, <laughs> in existence. And But what I'd like to emphasise with that is that really important role in somebody encouraging me in, because I think it may be different for your generation, I'm 56, but there's always in the back of my mind and women of my generation, a sort of a fear of two things, a fear of being seen as being pushy and a fear of failure. And of course, if you don't put yourself up for something, you haven't failed. And that's something that I feel really, really important for, for well, even back to my teaching at, at time as well. And I don't, I'd be interested to hear what, what you feel about this, but that this, this feel of failure amongst women is something we need to look at quite hard because actually when you failed at something, the chances are that's where you've learned the real lesson. Yeah, you'll never forget the lesson where you failed at something. And I remember one of one of my previous managers saying, even when I was thinking of going for a job sometime, um, well, if you don't go for it, nobody will want know you want to do it. So sometimes you just you, we have to put ourselves out and we have to support each other to get past that sort of fear zone. Because actually, yeah, 99 times out of 100, failing doesn't matter. And if we haven't failed, we haven't tried. And if we haven't tried, you're not going to go to the next stage. But sorry, you've given a politician the microphone and I'll, I'll just keep on moidering on if you give me half a chance. No, no, I really appreciated that. And the fact that you were touching on failure, because especially being a woman of influence and us young women were always taught to take opportunities. But there's that concept of failure that always stops us. But then, yeah. you know, 
it's the actual taking of the opportunity where you learn the lesson, whether you think you fail or not, it's your own perception. And I think it's really important that you're encouraged and you remember those words of encouragement. They, they are there on the journey and they really help. So yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, in regards to the pandemic and lockdown, I was just thinking, has COVID changed the way you see your job now? Were there any aspects you didn't pay attention to before? It's, um, it has been an extraordinary time. I mean, it, my professional career has been spent, an awful lot of it has been spent physically running around, getting from place to place. Um, that would have happened when I used to work for the Further Education College because we were scattered across four counties. Um, it would also be very, very true being an MP because this is the second largest constituency in Wales. I think we're we're over 800 square miles or something like 840 square miles. Um, my constituency office is 45 miles away from my home and I haven't been to it in the last 12 months. I've only been there twice. Um, well, from the 16th of March when we shut the office, I've uh, physically been to my office twice. Uh, and of course, much of my life would be spent physically running up and down to London. So to be in one place and actually concentrate on work in some ways has been quite liberating. There's this, the sheer surrealness of contributing to, into the chamber in Westminster in the House, in, in the House of Commons. Um, and this week I've been able, to, I've been very fortunate, I've been able to contribute four times into the chamber. But I'm doing it from my laptop with my books behind me. Sometimes the dogs kick off. Sometimes the, the, the postman is knocking at the window bring me parcels and I'm absolutely terrified this is going to be happening when I'm supposed to be on PMQs or something but it has it's made me think about the values of concentrating on what you need to do um, there's a risk of presenteeism and what we do now because we can do these sorts of contacts from afar and I do see many people spending far too much time in front of their screens but present physical presenteeism and the, the, again for somebody it's slightly different from you in London because you're used to having the resources there, but for representing a, a remote area where we're used to being expected to travel physically. So Cardiff is four and a half hours away. London is, if I stop so I drive safely, it's six or more hours away. Even in the train, it's with everything, it's five hours away. All those things added on, whereas now I can concentrate much more on what I'm supposed to be doing. The downside, of course, is that those natural human contacts everything has to be arranged like this and it's the just meeting somebody in the street or just meeting somebody in the corridor that doesn't happen but there are certainly there are real lessons about how we use our time and who this works for i think this sort of work works best for um more mature people in their organizations i do worry about young people going into organizations because you don't get those informal contacts where you can ask something whether something's okay and it's not an issue. You know, you, you can be a bit shy of that. So with, we're learning things immensely quickly. There will be an awful lot of changes happening. I think history will see this as one of the great change mills that we're living at the moment. So we can't really, it's difficult to evaluate it properly. I mean, I like how you had a very optimistic sort of approach to it, um, you know, with the traveling and everything. Now you can just focus and concentrate, like you mentioned, and you can take on that mindset to, um, again, learn from this. But when we get back into that contact, we're all gonna appreciate walking down the corridor, back in school. We all look forward to that. So I like the optimistic approach. Um, and then again, this could link to COVID or being a woman or the media or any other factors. Um, I understand politics is not an easy career. It comes with a lot of pressure and a lot of challenges. And I was just wondering what would be the biggest challenge you have faced? Um, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the day-to-day -day issues that face that face politicians again is, and I mean, so this batch for the for the party that I represent. Um, see, there are only there are only three of us in Westminster, so there's that sense of how do we get our voice across with an appropriate message, where the media is very much and 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 the nature of of UK politics. I mean, you know, is is adversarial and it's it's geared to having a them and us. It's geared to having a government and an opposition. And when you're, particularly for us, being a, 
a different sort of opposition, in many ways more similar to the SNP, but without the same numbers. The SNP represent the vast majority of the seats in Scotland, uh, in Westminster, is how we cut through. Um, is that that's a constant a constant challenge to us? I would say. I mean, on a personal level, being a politician and having a family. Um, at the moment, I said my, my daughters are grown up, but my mother lives with us. She was uh, she fell ill at Christmas, so, and that balancing all your lives, and effectively, you have a personal life. You have your Westminster life, which is very much in the, the, the theatre or the, 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 the public arena of politics. And then you have your constituency um, work as well. It's almost a, it's just a third profession, if you like, or a, a second profession with your family life. Uh, balancing all these and getting the, the level correct can be very challenging. Actually, on a personal level, it is the constituency stuff that is, is the most satisfactory because you can really feel that you've made a difference to somebody's lives somebody's life. Um, then I think what can actually be very stressful, particularly for women coming into politics, of course, is the fact that even more now, but nonetheless, it's it recently has been the same, is, is women's presence in social media and the, frankly, the sort of abuse that, that women, possibly younger women more so, certainly women of colour. Um, if I look at somebody like Diane Abbott, she has had more abuse on social media than the rest of us women polit politicians put together. And I mean, in her instance, I, I, they, they, she, she, she has said, I've, I've heard her say that if she complained about, if she, if she complained to the police about every death threat that she'd had, her whole time would be taken up in making victim statements so that you can't, you know, I, I've, I've had death threats. A man was sent to prison after making death threats to me, but it's, a, and it was, I mean, that's, makes you, you know, it, it makes you sit up. It, it, it is, it, it's shocking that people will say these things to you. That's the furthest extreme of it. Um, then you have to, you have to find a persona on social media whereby you deal with a level of abuse. Obviously there are points of abuse which are unacceptable. I'm not, if you see what I mean, I'm not, I'm not condoning that Diane Abbott has to, can't go to the police. I'm, I'm shocked and appalled at it. I'm just, Putting it out there, in, in part, I think, because people really do need to know that this this is bad. You know, this is this is trying to shut people's voices up, trying to close them down. So you you do, if you're thinking of going into politics, it's worth thinking about how you prepare when you put yourself up as a a public face. There are two important considerations, I think, is how you deal with the abuse that will come, and also whichever party you go into, that party should be. For a woman going into politics and you, that party should be looking at how they can support you. You should not be on your own. And the second important role here is as soon as you do go into, when you start going into social media as a political voice, you are acting as a leader. And it's really important to think, okay, everything I put up now has an implication. I am influencing somebody in some way or other. So it's important to think is this the way I want to convey myself? Not just to perhaps to the immediate audience, if you're responding to somebody, but that's going to be out there forever. I mean, this is one of the things I, I quite feel for your generation, because when I was young, half the, stu well, the stupid things that I said, the stupid things that I wrote, they haven't survived. You know, I've got away with it, <laughs> you see what I mean? But now because everybody lives their social lives in digital format, that's going to exist forever. Now, don't worry if you have said silly things in the past, because we're going to be able to find a way of dealing with that. But as things stand, it's it's an entirely different environment to move into politics to that which I experienced. Um, thank you for that. You really touched upon some important issues that a lot of people may overlook when it comes to politicians, women particularly. We, you know, people may not assume they have the emotions and the same capacity to be touched by their words really through the screen they, they get very confident and they don't realize how much of an effect it can have and um, I think it's really important that you highlighted that um, so I'm going to now move and hand over the mic to Mackay and she's going to ask you her question so um, I'm Welsh myself so it would be interesting to know if there was a moment or a spark that made you really realize that you wanted to pursue Welsh politics well it's 
it was a longer process than that. I think it started off with university because I was doing Welsh and Irish and Aberystwyth, history. So I knew quite a lot about Irish history and, and Welsh history as well. Um, I think the, the passionate point is what I touched on at the beginning is that sense of belonging. And then the sense of belonging within a much smaller community than that which I grew up in. And also being part also of these two communities, the, the English speaking community and the Welsh speaking community. And there, you see, we're talking about far smaller number of people speaking Welsh. We're talking about say 21% of the population in Wales and not all of those would speak Welsh all the time. Although I live in a very Welsh speaking community. And when one of the things that, that gave me the sense of passion was that it would be, when I had the opportunity, or I might have the opportunity to make a difference to the lives of people in both those communities. And I think for politics, it's people go into politics for many different reasons. Some go into it because it is a career. Um, I would be a, left to my own devices. I would be quite critical of those people who go into it solely for it to be a career. It can be, it can pay reasonably well. You'll have some fun, you'll get a lot of opportunities. But the point of politics is the, the difficult way that we balance the rights and interests and justice and the benefits to different people. It will never be easy. It will never be straightforward. It will always have to be refound almost each generation. You have to go through the different challenges from each generation. So the people who I think people who go into politics should have a passion for justice, for social change, that you are representing a group of people who are otherwise without a voice because the people who are powerful and who have a voice will use that voice they will be able to put their power into effect. It is those people whose voice aren't, isn't central to the major dialogues, who aren't there in the room when the decisions are made. That's one of the interests with me with Ply Cymru, frankly. I mean, this, this, this again, if you're listening to Ruth Davidson, quite probably this is where the difference will lie. I very much feel that the UK is geared towards Southeast England. If you look at the, what's called the 12 regions and nations, the, the three, England is divided up into eight. Uh, I'm running out. Well, that must be divided up into nine. If I can get my sums right, uh, and the, the regions within the only the, the regions that return that, that pay in more in taxation than they receive in public funding are all based in the southeast. So there's something structural to me about the UK that when you're in London you don't see it, but when you're outside London you can really see it at work. And that's one of the passions for me with Wales is how do we move away from this sense of being of being told that we are dependent and not able to manage ourselves and that this has to be done from Westminster. Actually, no, we look at the other small countries of, of Europe. And if you look at Ireland even, which you know we're, we're just going into a century as it gradually grew into growing into its independence. And far more recently, if you look at the small Baltic states, um, you know, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia in a different history, but Finland as well. They can do well. You know, we live at a time when borrowing money is as cheap as it's ever been. And yet we've been told that we, well, that we wouldn't have survived COVID unless Westminster had, had directed funds towards us. But yes, it would be a long process in, initially to, to work towards independence, but otherwise it's being in a condition of dependency indefinitely. Now, what independence actually will mean, the actual structure of that may, you know, we've yet to work that out and what it will mean in relation to the currency, um, again, the Irish kept the, the, kept sterling for a number of years when they got independence. What will it mean in relation to the monarchy? Again, this is something that could be discussed. The monarchy works across the Commonwealth as well. What would it mean in terms of border? Where into Ireland, the Irish Free State, we've had freedom of movement. We still have freedom of movement. That's part of the Good Friday Agreement and the com complexities of Brexit. These would be, you know, these are complex matters. Politics is complex. But the present condition of dependency is no is not serving the communities that I love well. So, you know, let's think about the different ways of working. Yeah, I do think it's interesting how we don't really see um, MPs going from where they're originally from to other devolved nations to pursue politics. So I do, do think it's very interesting to see the dynamic and how that works. And on the topic of independence, do you think there could possibly be a referendum in Wales in the next five years, maybe? Well, my party is proposing, well, going into the next Senedd elections, the Senedd being the, the Welsh Parliament, which is 
almost certainly going to be held in May this year in holding uh, an, a, a, a commission looking at holding a referendum on independence. So, and part of that, we will be looking to hold what they, we call a citizens convention. So with, in consultation with people in Wales about what sort of referendum this would be, exactly what the issues would be, to talk this through further. And again, actually Ireland's done this pretty effectively. Um, they, they talked about uh, gay marriage and abortion, and there was another one, there's been three, if not four, uh, citizens conventions in Ireland now. So it's a, it'll be a decision for the people of Wales, um, but certainly that that is one of the major points that my party is going into this, this election now to offer that. I mean, you know, the other parties, Labour are talking about it in terms of uh, a, a, a federal relationship. They haven't detailed exactly what that would mean either. But the one thing that I can say is that the, the present arrangement with devolution just doesn't work very well. In terms of we get into abstract concepts, what we have in the Senate is a legislature, a body that can make laws, but we haven't got a legal jurisdiction. So we haven't got the structure whereby we put those laws into effect. We're probably the only legislature in the world in that position. We're England and Wales when it comes to the jurisdiction. And you get just things don't work very well. So you'll have um, just even on, on, on the picture of, of say, with, with children's rights, much of children's law is devolved into Wales, but you'll still have an, in, an interface between England there. And it's just not always clear who's, who should be doing what. Um, with the what's been called the um, the UK Internal Market Act, the Westminster government actually will now be able to step in and stop certain decisions made in Wales. Say, for example, the um, the plastic bags uh, that first came. In, I know it's come in in England now, but that first came in in Wales to uh, raise five p to charge five p on a plastic bag. If that was perceived as being um, acting against the interests of businesses in England that were operating in Wales, then Westminster could stop that happening. So we're seeing uh, changes in powers, which again really is, is, is taking powers away, away from Cardiff. I would be arguing that we haven't got enough powers there. And it all comes, much of this comes down to actually answerability. We have politicians in Cardiff who now, they, they can now raise taxes, but you politicians must have the means to do to full effect what they're trying to do so they must be held to effect properly. What they've had in Cardiff is they've been given money and then told how to been allowed to spend it. They've never really been held to account. It's not, you know, we're 20, this is the 22nd year now of the, of the Senate existing. It's, it's a slowly maturing democracy, um, but we, I think we need more. I think by now we know we need more. Um, my final question is, do you have any advice for young women coming into such a male-dominated career? Um, find ways of supporting each other to be brave. Um, there should be, there is no reason whatsoever that there shouldn't be 50% representation of women. Um, and anything less than that must always be questioned, obviously, because why wouldn't it be? Yeah. The things I was saying earlier on, you make mistakes, forgive yourself, and go for it. Yeah. And there, you know, there will be times when people are awful. There will be times when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and think, what on earth am I doing? And that's where the passion comes in. Because if I thought about when I'm being adversarial, with the Prime Minister, either on screen or in, in the chamber. And I think about it, oh, how on earth do I do that? That is so embarrassing. And then I remember why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because there's somebody who's going to lose out. You know, I'm doing it because I'm trying to get justice for somebody who won't get it otherwise. And that gives you a backbone. So find your passion and just go for it. Thank you so much. Um, just before we finish, um, I have a prayer. So, Father God, may we live and work and learn in a world which is ever more equal. Lord, please help us each to play our part in shaping this world into a better place for everyone. Amen. Um, so thank you so much, Liz, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, I hope you have a good day. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye now.